an intro to Norse mythology and Viking history. Norse mythology is one of the more fascinating subjects to discuss. It's a subject that could be told in terms of lavish, bombastic tellings of larger-than-life gods and epic wars, or it could be told in a way that sees these gods and goddesses as humans. Humans with unmatched power, but humans nonetheless. It's also fascinating because there was never one definitive translation of the myths. Even the loose structure of the timeline can be experimented with in different ways. Norse mythology was also passed down orally as opposed to written text, which means that the stories would fade over time. By only salvaging certain characters or certain myths would leave many plot holes in the stories as they were left to others to interpret. That alone causes debates among scholars as they try to untangle the webs and fill in the blanks. We've even had to scratch our heads at the confusion that it leaves. What were the nine worlds? Were these gods the same person? Did this god even exist? We tried our best to iron it out and explain the wrinkles along the way. The Viking Age to begin, we have to give a small history lesson, though. Specifically, we will focus on the Icelandic Vikings. The Scandinavian Vikings mostly inhabited the countries of Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. But what drove them to pillage and plunder until they ultimately settled in Iceland? Most Scandinavian people lived on islands or peninsulas so expansion where they were would have been out of the question. The lands they also inhabited had poor terrain and were not very suitable for farming. Population growth was also happening as well. And with the new advances in agriculture at the time, the life expectancy was longer than it had been. More people on these islands and peninsulas meant that there was an increasing amount of bickering between clans. Once the pillaging began, some men made their living on this dangerous line of work. This would turn it into a way of life for some. For others, it was exile. Viking law would send criminals off on their own, which meant that pillaging might have taken place at the hands of convicted criminals. Another fuel for pillaging would have been greed. The Vikings had the same needs as everyone else but they were able to obtain the things they needed through violence. This would have made at least a few Vikings pillage because of their own greed. But why Iceland? There had been two Viking voyagers that drifted onto the land, but it wasn't until Floki Vilgardarsson was deliberately gone to Iceland for colonization that interest rose. Ice had blocked Floki's return to Norway, so he had to stay longer than he had hoped for. As he left, he would give it the name of Iceland. When he returned to Norway, he would tell everyone of the inhospitable land of ice and snow. But two members of his crew, Herjolf and Thorolf, said that the island was beautiful. While it was his crew members' praise of the land that encouraged settlement, they kept the name Iceland given to it by Floki. Interest was fueled by attractive and affordable lands available to voyagers because of the warmer climate of Iceland at the time. They also noted that Iceland had a valuable resource to trade in walrus ivory. While they were known for their pillaging, Vikings often gave up the violent life for a peaceful one wherever they settled. However, they would have already gained a bad reputation among the European coasts. This meant that there was a growing resistance to Vikings, which forced them to seek out settlements and begin a peaceful life. Another reason could have been the taxes that the king was placing on the farmers in Norway. Some lands were taken freely, while some bought or were given land from earlier settlers. There was still some land that was taken in the forceful Viking way. There was also one growing factor that made Iceland appealing to the Scandinavians. Christian influence was rapidly spreading across Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. 
However, in Iceland, there was a sort of tug-of-war game between the Christian missionaries and their Viking followers who had converted on their own and the pagans. This back and forth would last for well over a century until Christianity took hold of the country in the year 1000. The rest of the Scandinavian countries had already fallen, as Norway's king had converted two years before that. This left lawmaker and pagan Thorgeir Thorkelson in a precarious position of trying to keep the peace in Iceland. When a majority of Icelandic people learned of the king's conversion, he knew they would soon convert as well. Conversion would lead to tension, and Thorkelson was fearful that further bloodshed would find its way to Iceland. He knew that would be the outcome because it had been happening elsewhere. Probably not his favorite choice, but in order to avoid civil war, Thorkelson proposed a one law and one religion which ratified Christianity into law and banished paganism. When the other Scandinavian countries fell into conversion, they cut all ties with Norse paganism. Iceland, contrarily, was willing to embrace where they had come from and their history as a people. The quotes around banished were also because Thorkelson made a side note for practicing pagans. While the country had to be Christian, the pagans could continue to worship the old gods in secret. It still gives pagans the short stick, but avoiding war with even more mounting tensions happening was for the best. Yes, Iceland was about to have more heated debates over their country's practices. In the 13th century, the country would be in the midst of a violent political battle. Between transforming politics and the new way of Christian life taking over, the fear of losing their heritage took over. In order to avoid misunderstandings of their cultural identities and belief systems, it became important for Icelandic individuals to find a method of preservation. Stories that were only passed forward by word of mouth, such as children learn when playing the game of telephone, the end product might compromise cultural integrity. So for the first time, Icelandic people wrote out Viking lore and Norse mythology to preserve who they were. Viking lore, also known as sagas, would be tales of the past, but they were tales about regular men and women. Occasionally the gods were mentioned, but they were given much more human qualities than the already human versions painted in the Eddas. This was unheard of in this time frame, and it still is a feat for what they accomplished. Those sagas would be the earliest versions of what would become the modern novel. The stories would have a hero, a problem, a story structure, and then they would have a conclusion. To preserve the Norse mythology, they would have to turn to the rock stars of the Viking Age, the Skulls, or more so what the Skulls were known for. Their claim to fame was the art of poetry. To the Vikings, poetry was nothing to scoff at. Poetry was considered to be a gift handed to humans from Odin himself. So the Skalds were basically revered in Norse culture, since they were given this gift by the All-Father. They were also the reason Norse mythology would survive, because they had kept the myths alive just long enough to make it to written form. That is how we got the second half of the preservation with the Eddas.